Happy Monday, everyone. Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station. Thank you all for tuning in, uh, and I uh, hope you enjoy the stream today. Uh, so if you're tuning in for the first time, welcome. So glad you're joining us. Uh, we are streaming live on Mondays and Wednesdays uh, at 6 p.m. And on Mondays, we are doing a What's Up stream for the week where I'm going to show you different stars and constellations you'll see uh, for the week. It'll be our little star tour. And then on Wednesday, we're doing a deep dive live stream. We've covered a number of topics over the past few weeks, uh, including uh, stellar evolution, the solar system tour. Um, we've talked about fantastical worlds of fiction, uh, which was a really popular stream. And if you miss any of these streams and want to rewatch them, all uh, recordings of all the streams can be found uh, online uh, on the Union Station and Planetarium Facebook page. So be sure to check that out if you missed any of them. Uh, also, my lighting's being a little weird. I'm going to adjust something on the fly here. Hope you all don't mind. Ooh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Uh, that's how you know it's live. Um, so, uh, like I said, today we are going to uh, talk about what's up in our night sky for the week. Uh, but before we start, um, I like to start by uh, talking about news and just going over some of the space happenings that uh, have happened over the past week. Uh, and really the main news story that I want to talk about uh, is the SpaceX launch. Uh, now, uh, we did a watch party for the live stream uh, of this launch on Saturday. Uh, so if you joined us for that, thank you so much for tuning into that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and thank you to uh, my colleagues Jordan and Jeff for joining us for that as well uh, to uh, provide commentary and information about that launch. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and if you missed that, uh, an historic event happened on Saturday. Uh, this launch was scheduled uh, for uh, last Wednesday, but uh, due to weather, it was rescheduled, and then the actual launch took place on Saturday. And uh, so what was this launch? Um, I actually have a, sort of a highlight reel uh, prepared here, so we're going to switch our scenes. This is on the uh, NASA uh, YouTube page. Um, and, oops. Spoiler alert, let's go back to the beginning. Um, so uh, this launch was historic because this is the first time in nine years that uh, American astronauts launch, launched in an American rocket from American soil uh, since 2011. Uh, and 2011 was the final launch of the space shuttle program. And since then, we have been sending our American astronauts aboard the Soyuz spacecraft, which is a Russian spacecraft. Um, but uh, this launch day was uh, historic because uh, the United States finally uh, proved that it has the launch capability to bring American astronauts to space. And this is aboard the SpaceX Dragon 2 uh, crew capsule. Now, uh, SpaceX is a private space company, so this was also notable in that uh, this was the first uh, approved mission uh, of a collaboration between NASA, which is a government agency, and a private company, SpaceX. Uh, now, uh, the point of this is uh, to, uh, and then the reason NASA is uh, sort of now contracting other companies to send their astronauts to space uh, is because low Earth orbit, which is um, orbit that uh, just only goes to uh, close to uh, the uh, International Space Station, so in sort of close to the Earth, um, is uh, w with technology advancements, we are able to go up there pretty cheaply, and these private companies can make it even cheaper. SpaceX, for example, uh, makes their launches uh, uh, reduces the cost of their launches by reusing parts of the rocket, um, much more than we were able to reuse rocket parts back during the shuttle program. Uh, so we can see uh, Bob and Doug, the two astronauts aboard this demo mission, uh, greeting their families as they get ready to hop in their Tesla to go to the launch site. Of course, uh, SpaceX had to have Teslas involved since uh, those two companies are uh, closely related. Uh, so we can see two astronauts getting ready to go on a launch pad, and we'll kind of fast forward here to the launch pad. Um, so as I was saying, it's important uh, for uh, low Earth orbit to be moved to commercial companies because that allows NASA to focus on deep space exploration, eventually sending humans uh, back to the moon and eventually to Mars. And since NASA now doesn't have to worry about rockets that are sending astronauts to the space station, they can focus on those other projects. Um, so this is a pretty exciting launch. We can see them hopping into the space capsule. Now this space capsule probably looks pretty different from what uh, a lot of people are used to. Not a lot of buttons and knobs. In fact, um, everything is controlled with three touch screens and the actual launch and docking maneuvers are all automatic. 
Um, so in a, an emergency, the astronauts couldn't control manually, but this is all automatic. And uh, basically, they were just kind of along for the ride to test this out and make sure it all worked. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so this launch happened on Saturday, uh, and the weather was a little iffy at the beginning, um, but it did eventually happen. So uh, the final countdown takes place here. And we'll be able to eventually see that launch. So the Dragon capsule is the capsule on top, but this is aboard the Falcon 9 rocket, a rocket that SpaceX has flown many times and is notable for its ability to re-enter the atmosphere safely and land uh, intact to be able to be reused. And they have reused many of these rockets for satellite launches. This one, taking humans to space, was a brand new one, but the idea is that in the future they would reuse these rockets, and that reduces the cost to up to 90%. Um, so, you know, sending astronauts to space would be uh, just 10 percent of uh, the uh, or what it traditionally has costed even though the space shuttle was uh, reusable in a sense uh, when it landed it was basically taken completely apart and put back together again every time before it launched again so even the space shuttle program was extremely expensive um, and not truly reusable uh, but the idea here is that these boosters would just be able to come back to earth and then be refilled with fuel before they went back to space um, so a couple of little things. We talked a lot about uh, the launch, and I think you, I'm not sure if you can re-watch our watch party with the comments. Um, you may be able to do that. I'm not sure. Um, maybe uh, my social media friends can help answer that question for me. But um, in the meantime, uh, so we talked about a couple of things. One thing we brought up is this uh, max Q that the rocket just reached at about one minute and one second. That is the maximum, uh, maximum dynamic pressure. Um, basically, the rocket is traveling uh, fast enough and it's going through a thick enough layer of atmosphere that it is experiencing the most amount of pressure that it experiences in its launch. When it goes past this point, even though it's going faster, the atmosphere is thinner so there's less pressure on it. But that max Q point is sort of the, the biggest point of, of force on the rocket as it's launching. And from that point on, it's essentially sort of downhill. Um, MECO stands for Main Engine Cutoff. And that comes right here, where we see the booster separating from uh, the top of the rocket. And the astronauts continuing on to orbit while the booster comes back down to Earth. And so um, for these launches, they have uh, cameras on the outside of the rockets as well as the inside. Uh, this ride looks a lot more relaxing than uh, space shuttle launches were. Um, and if I fast forward enough here, this is the camera on the booster as it's coming back down to Earth. Um, and uh, we will go ahead and fast forward here. And actually, this um, is a better view of the booster landing. So let's see if I can track down that video because it was very cool. Definitely want to show you guys that. Um, oftentimes, the camera cuts out uh, as the booster is landing on the landing pad there. Um, but it is a very, very cool shot, so I definitely want to want to bring that up if I can track it down, of course. Uh, and I might not. I thought I had it a moment ago, but clearly I didn't. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you eventually see the, the booster there sitting on the landing pad. This is on a barge floating out in the ocean, uh, so when the rocket lands it uh, is safe just in case it doesn't land smoothly. Um, but eventually the uh, two astronauts did get to orbit uh, and uh, after a about a 17 hour uh, ride which included uh, some sleep time while they were just waiting to catch up with the International Space Station they did eventually dock with the International Space Station which those highlights can be found on a different video um, but uh, the astronauts did eventually uh, come back or did eventually board the uh, International Space Station which uh, we can find. So here's uh, the footage of the uh, Dragon capsule eventually docking. This is a schematic showing where it, it docks. And uh, uh, it should be a video of them actually entering the capsule. Looks like maybe it's a uh, video around here. Well, here they are, uh, the two astronauts that were aboard the, uh, the demo mission and then the three astronauts that are on the space, sh space station right now. So 
a pretty exciting launch, uh, and uh, you can find more of those highlights uh, if you just go to NASA's uh, YouTube pages or uh, their Twitter or Facebook. Um, a lot of cool stuff there. Uh, so pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Doug and Bob are going to be on the International Space Station for about 100 or so days, and they're going to be testing out things about the capsule before they take it back down to Earth. And then eventually uh, the first actual crewed mission, uh, which they're calling Crew Mission 1, uh, will happen later this year, and that's going to take four astronauts aboard the Dragon capsule up there uh, to do a, an official science mission. So this was just a test mission, uh, but after this is all successful, NASA will sign them off and basically say, okay, we're going to use these uh, SpaceX rockets for all of our future astronaut launches to the International Space Station, at least. Uh, and Doug and Bob will be doing a little bit of science up there, too, because, you know, can't resist doing that while you're up there, um, for sure. Uh, so it's pretty exciting, uh, and yeah, I just wanted to do a, get on a tiny soapbox here because some people might be wondering, well, what's the hullabaloo about this? Why are we even going to the International Space Station? What are we doing up there? Um, and a lot of people don't realize that uh, the International Space Station is doing a lot of important research uh, for us back here on Earth, uh, and a lot of the research is medical research. So they're actually doing uh, really important uh, cancer research uh, up there at the space station, testing out procedures that can only happen in microgravity. Um, right now they're researching uh, pandemic pro or proteins that could help with pandemic response uh, for safer treatment. So something very relevant today. Uh, they're producing organs and tissues in art uh, in, uh, artificially in uh, uh, microgravity. Uh, that could someday help prevent human disease. They're also researching other things like fiber optic technology which would help with faster internet speeds. So a lot of those things uh, do come back and help us here on Earth. And not to mention just the, uh, the scientific discoveries made in uh, the aerospace, uh, uh, aerospace area um, that eventually help us with uh, uh, airline safety. So if you've ever taken an, uh, an airplane flight in the past 50 years, you can owe a lot of those advancements. Uh, and technological improvements to space exploration as well. So exciting stuff uh, and historic day for sure. And it's nice that the United States is back to sending our own astronauts to space. Um, so yeah, uh, before we start our star tour, let's check in on the comments uh, and uh, see, it looks like, uh, so I was talking before about the, uh, the live stream that we did. So you can rewatch the entire uh, NASA live stream if you want, uh, it should still be uh, on our Facebook page um, and you can see the comments that we left they just won't sync up with the replay so you won't be able to tell exactly when the comments happen but you'll be able to see those comments and hopefully learn something from that um, other questions Eric is asking uh, if there or how many other companies are trying to launch and where do they stand in their progress that's a great question and there are a lot of other private companies uh, that are working on uh, space exploration um, most notably, NASA actually has announced very recently, about a month or so ago, that they've chosen three private companies to uh, help them design lunar landers for their uh, lunar missions. And those companies um, are going to be uh, SpaceX. Uh, uh, let me double check um, the other two, just to make sure I get the names right. Um, but uh, SpaceX is one of them. Uh, Blue Origin is an, an, another, which Blue Origin is a private company um, that uh, has ties to uh, Amazon and uh, Jeff Bezos. So they're working on an orbital class rocket right now. And then another company called uh, Dynetics, um, which is a company I'm not very familiar with, but those three companies will design different uh, uh, lander systems to eventually bring astronauts uh, back to the moon. Uh, but uh, like I said, um, Blue Origin is one of those other uh, notable uh, companies, and that is that was founded by Jeff Bezos, who's famous for uh, Amazon, and um, got weird like uh, perturbations in space time happening with my green screen right now. Uh, lighting is very weird. Uh, we I don't know if you know this, but for all these live streams, we've been using natural lighting <laughs> from my windows, uh, so uh, things have been uh, kind of interesting to keep up with as the seasons are changing. Oop, that's not going to help. Um, I think maybe I need to do this one. Hey, we're going to we're going to do this live. Uh, let's see. All right. There we go. All right. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay. Um, so Blue Origin is a notable one. Uh, Virgin Galactic is another company um, that uh, Richard Branson uh, founded uh, of uh, the Virgin Airlines. Um, they're working on a uh, another rocket that uh, still hasn't reached orbit yet, but um, they're currently developing that. 
Um, and uh, Boeing is also another company that NASA often contracts with um, that is a private company working on. They, they're mostly working on the, uh, the components for the space launch system, which is NASA's, NASA's own heavy launch system that they're planning on using for their Mars missions. So uh, quite a few private companies, and those are just American companies. There are private companies uh, in other countries that are doing similar things. Uh, and then uh, Stephanie asked how long will it be till the astronauts get back. Like I said, they are planning on being there for about 120 days officially, um, uh, which seems like a long time, but I guess they have plenty to do up there. Uh, and uh, then they'll take the uh, Dragon capsule back down, and uh, they'll also be reusing the Dragon capsule itself. Uh, so they'll clean it up and, you know, uh, vacuum and all that stuff uh, before they send those four astronauts up later this year. Um, so exciting stuff, uh, and yeah, that kind of catches us up with uh, the fun announcements and news that happened. So we're going to switch back over to Stellarium, uh, and there's still weird things happening behind me, but I'm not going to stress too much about it. Uh, maybe I'll stress a little bit about it. All right, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're back at Stellarium, and we'll drop a link to this software in the comments if you missed that, because this is a free piece of software uh, that you can ooh, uh, you can use uh, to sort of have your own little virtual planetarium. Uh, so uh, you can see I have set mine to have the Kansas City skyline in the background. Um, the Union Station there. We're standing on the lawn of the Liberty Memorial. Uh, with the World War One Museum and Memorial behind us there towards the south. Uh, now, this is not a great place to go stargazing. I wouldn't recommend actually coming to this exact spot for stargazing, mostly because all these lovely buildings in our Kansas City skyline are very bright. All those uh, man-made light sources are going to make it hard to see the stars. This is thanks to something called light pollution. Uh, bright lights from buildings and street lights and car headlights shine up into the sky and bounce off our atmosphere, and when you're near a big city like KC, it's often hard to see the stars uh, at nighttime. It's also hard to see the stars at daytime, mostly because of this star, the sun. Our daytime star is shining brightly over there towards the west. Uh, and uh, it is the only star we can see in the daytime. It's important to remember, though, that the other stars are up in the daytime. Uh, they're just hiding behind our blue sky. In fact, we can see the constellations there as they would appear in our daytime sky. Also wanted to mention over here towards the east, we can see the moon rising. Now, a lot of people don't may not realize this, although you've probably noticed it, but you can see the moon in the daytime sometimes. When it is waxing, you can often see it in the early evening, and when it's waning, you can see it sometimes in the early morning. Um, right now, the moon is in a waxing gibbous phase. The word waxing means that it's currently getting bigger and brighter, and gibbous means that it's more than half full, but it's not quite completely full. And when it's waxing, that means that after the sun sets, the moon will still be up, and it'll be up for much of the night. And unfortunately, when the moon is gibbous, so much of it is illuminated that the moon is actually a great source of light pollution, then it'll make it hard to see the stars as well. So just bear that in mind when you're planning on going stargazing. When the moon is waning is when it's best to go stargazing, because when the moon is waning, it rises a little bit later than sunset. So if you catch it right after, or if you look at the night sky right after sunset, you won't get the moon in your way. But we do want to get that sun to set so we can see the stars. So let's go ahead and fast forward time here. Now, as we approach the summer solstice this month, which is hard to believe, um, the days are getting longer. The longest day of the year will be on the 21st of this month, uh, June 21st. Um, so uh, right now, the sun sets pretty late. In fact, uh, you can see that the sun was still in twilight at 9 p.m. tonight. And really, you want to wait about an hour after sunset to get a good view of the night sky. So about like 10.30 tonight, um, you know, 10, 10 o'clock to 10.30 will probably be the best time for stargazing because all that twilight has gotten out of the way. So we're going to be spinning our star tour around then, even though that's pretty late and oftentimes past my bedtime. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into our star tour. Now, if you've tuned in often, uh, I might be starting to sound like a broken record because I often like to start with the same two star patterns. Mostly just because if you are uh, tuning in for the first time, this is a uh, familiar place to start out with, uh, and it's always good to kind of uh, get everyone on the same page and get our bearings in our night sky before we dive into something more complicated. Um, so I like starting with these two spoon shapes in the sky called the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. You can see them towards the north, and right now the Little Dipper is below the Big Dipper this season. 
These two patterns are very famous patterns and are well known around the world. I do want to mention though that they are not technically official constellations. These are unofficial star patterns, uh, a group of patterns that we call asterisms. Um, now I should mention or talk a little bit more about constellations in general. There are 88 of them total. These were picked back in 1930 by an organization called the International Astronomical Union. Uh, 42 of them are animals, 29 are inanimate objects, and the other 17 are people or characters from mythology. But uh, these constellations are mostly adapted from Western uh, mythology, especially the ones in the Northern Hemisphere, and all the ones uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, or many of them, were from uh, later European and American explorers. So it stands to reason that people around the world probably see more than just 88 patterns up there, right? You know, there are different cultures besides uh, Greek cultures and European cultures, so... Um, yeah, so there are a lot of other patterns there that other cultures see, and so astronomers have come up with a different name for those patterns. We call them asterisms. Now, this is not to mean that they're any less important or less significant. In fact, constellations are technically not even patterns themselves. Technically, to an astronomer, all a constellation is is a region of our night sky. And if we map out these regions, the night sky looks more like a big puzzle. This is mostly because astronomers like to categorize things that they find in the night sky. Um, and to categorize them, you need a location for them, kind of like a state boundary. So if I found a deep space object in this area of the night sky, I would say that it was in this constellation, even if it's not near the lines. So that's really what a constellation is. And if we want to get nitpicky, technically every star pattern connecting the dots here is an asterism. Technically, the only things that are actually constellations are these shapes in the sky. But, you know, that's uh, it doesn't really make for as exciting of stargazing so <laughs> so um there are two official constellations that use these stars they're called ursa major and ursa minor which means the big bear and the little bear the big bear contains the stars of the big dipper and it's kind of upside down this time of year its tail is the handle of the spoon its body is made of the four stars of the spoon plus these two below it its head goes down to this pointy star and then its legs extend off to the side again there's the tail the body the head and the legs. Kind of hard to point this out with a mouse pointer, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, point this out with a, a laser pointer in a real planetarium soon. By the way, I did want to mention uh, the planetarium is starting to open next week. Um, just go to unionstation.org for more information. We are opening to members only at the start uh, on Wednesday, and then the following Wednesday we'll be opening to the public. We're going to be open from Wednesday through Sunday, so close on Mondays and Tuesdays for now. But this is all changing very rapidly, so just go to unionstation.org for that information. Um, so Ursa Minor is the little bear, and it uses a similar star pattern. You can see those shapes there. Now, of course, bears don't have long tails, but uh, we don't really know why these star patterns ended up with long tails. So uh, there's a very famous and important star in the Little Dipper, the star at the end of the Little Dipper's tail, in fact, is the important one. Its official scientific name is Polaris, but a lot of you probably are fam more familiar with it by its nickname, uh, and that nickname is the North Star. Now the North Star is called the North Star because it points north, but you might be wondering, well, why isn't this star the North Star, or why isn't this star the North Star? There's something special about this star, and it's not that it's the brightest star in the sky, because Polaris is actually the 45th brightest star, so it's not even anywhere close. But for, uh, the real reason the North Star is special is because throughout the night, it is the only star that stays in the same place. If I fast forward time again, you can see that the stars appear to rotate around our night sky, but the North Star stays in roughly the same location. This is why, no matter where you are on planet Earth, and no matter what time of night it is, if you can find that North Star, you can always find North, because the North Star always points North. Let's head back to our star tour time, which is right around 10 p.m. Uh, now, uh, the reason for this has to do with the uh, Earth's layout in relation to the stars. And I have this really cool globe that I brought on camera before, um, but I'll bring it back just because it's a great visual aid. You can imagine all the stars in our sky is laid out as a sphere around us. Now this is now the night sky really is. Some stars are further away than others, so really they are laid out in this 3D grid. But for our purposes, when we're looking at star shapes, we can imagine them in a sphere like this, and we can imagine the Earth inside. Now the Earth rotates once every 24 hours. This is what gives us daytime and nighttime, but the stars 
around the Earth don't change that much. So, as you can imagine, humans on the Earth sort of go for a ride as this rotation happens. And throughout the night, you will see similar stars, but they'll be in different orientations. So if you're in North America at a certain time, I'll try to orient it so like if you're standing on North America there, um, at a certain time of day, this star would be right above you. But if we, oops, if we rotate the Earth a little bit to a different time of day, a different star would be right above you. But no matter where you are, the North Star is always in the same spot relative to the Earth because the North Star is directly above the North Pole. And as the Earth rotates, the North Pole is always in relatively the same location too. So hopefully that kind of helps to uh, explain why that North Star is special and why it doesn't move. Let's go back over to Stellarium. And uh, we're going to move right along because I blabbed on a little bit too long about uh, the SpaceX launch. Hope you all don't mind, um, but that's okay because uh, a lot of the stuff we've gone over in previous Star Tours and if you want to check any of them out, you can always re-watch them, but I will still go over some highlights. Uh, I do love the Liberty Memorial, but it is quite large, so we are going to hide it uh, for just a moment. We're going to get a bit of a flatter view of the sky, that way you can see uh, the moon shining up there in the south. So uh, let's check out this constellation right here. This is Leo the Lion. You can find Leo by using an asterism that looks like a backwards question mark or a coat hanger hook. This is the lion's head and his mane. Here's the lion's body, his front paws, and his tail. He represents Leo the Lion, the ferocious beast that Hercules fought and defeated during the first of his twelve labors. The star at the end of Leo's tail is named Denebola. Denebola means tail of the lion in Arabic. We've got this star down here. This is one of the brighter stars in the sky, and it's part of Virgo the Maiden, which decided to show up without me asking. There you go. Sorry, I had to trace that for you. Um, Virgo looks like a big stick figure, so this is Virgo's head, her arms, her body, and her legs. She's sort of holding the moon under her arm like a basketball right now. Virgo represents a goddess of fertility and harvest. The Greeks called her Demeter, the Romans called her Ceres. She's often depicted as carrying an ear of grain in one hand, signifying uh, the harvest. In fact, that star in Virgo's hand is named Spica, and Spica means ear of grain in Latin. There's another bright star up here. In fact, this is the second brightest star in the entire sky and the brightest star in the evening right now. It's called Arcturus. It's part of a constellation that kind of looks like a spilled ice cream cone. Uh, it's uh, called Buotis, this constellation. He was a hunter. Arcturus means watcher of the bear in ancient Greek, and so some stories had uh, the hunter Buotis watching some bears as he was uh, hunting other animals. Now, Arcturus and Spica are very notable stars. They're quite bright, and they stand out in the sky. And there is a trick you can use to remember their names and find them. All you have to do is locate the Big Dipper and find its handle, and you'll notice the handle is shaped like an arc. If you extend that arc across the sky, you can see it passes through these two stars. Now, if you remember this little saying, arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica, then you can remember how to find these two stars. So just remember, arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica, and you can find those stars. Now, if you connect to Arcturus, Spica, and Denebola, those three stars I pointed out to you, they form a nice big triangle in our night sky. Oops. Um, and this triangle can be seen high in the southern sky uh, during this time of year. In the springtime, though, it can be seen rising in the east. This is an asterism called the Spring Triangle. Now, there's another famous asterism called the Summer Triangle that is still rising. In fact, we can see a couple of its stars. We can see... Uh, the star Vega, we can see the star Deneb, and then the third star is still not risen yet because, well, it's still not summer. But by June 21st, the three stars of the Summer Triangle will have risen. Now, these triangle tools were asterisms that ancient people used to help them figure out the changing seasons. Uh, so based on where these stars are after sunset, that tells you which season we're in. I want to point out a notable constellation that uh, we are seeing for the first time during our star tours, and I'm going to cheat a tiny bit and fast forward just a smidge. And this is the constellation Scorpio, the scorpion. 
You can find Scorpio by looking for this fan of four stars coming from this red one here. This is meant to be the scorpion's claws, and then its body curves downwards, which uh, it's a little hard to see uh, this particular time of year. Uh, but again, in the summertime, this will be prominent in our southern skies. The scorpion was a monster that the hero Orion battled. Uh, Orion is a winter constellation, of course. Uh, I want to tell a kind of funny story, though, because this star here is named Antares. Um, now, this star is so red that ancient people often mistook it for Mars, the red planet. And they actually made this mistake so many times that they eventually decided to name this star Antares, which literally means not Mars. <laughs> so they just use that little trick to remember, hey, that's not a planet. There is another way you can tell it's not a planet, though, because you can see this star is twinkling, just like all the other stars in the sky. Planets do not twinkle in our night sky. If you're wondering about the planets and if there are any visible tonight, there are, but you're going to have to stay up a little bit later. You're going to have to wait till around midnight, or around 1 a.m. Two planets will rise right around that time. And, woo, these are the planets uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter being the brighter one here, and Saturn being the one next to it. Now, I wanted to show you that uh, Jupiter and Saturn are doing something kind of cool right now and uh, I'm just gonna hopefully show you all uh, a picture of what I'm talking about um, so Jupiter and Saturn this year are getting closer and closer together and at some point this year later this year uh, they will be in conjunction which means uh, they will be the closest that they ever appear in our night sky together um, Let's see, is this the one I wanted? Nope. All right. Sorry, folks. Uh, oh, here it is. Just took a second for me to find it. Um, so here is a graphic just showing us uh, this path of the conjunctus. It might be a little hard to read, but basically these dots are showing the path of Jupiter and Saturn throughout uh, this year, uh, as well as Mars passing by here. Mars was actually in conjunction earlier in the springtime. Um, but you'll see Jupiter and Saturn will appear to get close, and then kind of far away, and then close again, and then eventually uh, they will be in their great conjunction, which is the closest they ever appear, and that will be at this point right here, where they will appear 0.1 degrees away from each other. That will be on December 21st of this year. Um, now, this motion you'll see here, they kind of change directions and then go the other direction, uh, back the way they came. This is called a retrograde motion. You might have heard of that mentioned in astrology. Uh, it doesn't signify anything about your... Um, your horoscope all it is is an interaction between the angle of the earth and the planets basically the outer planets are moving more slowly than the earth so at some certain points the earth will pass them and make it look like they're going backwards but really they're still moving they're just not moving as fast as we are so keep an eye out for these two planets this conjunction this great conjunction happens only once every uh, 20 years so a very exciting event to check out and we will definitely have some viewing opportunities for you at the planetarium if you'd like to look at this conjunction through a telescope as we get close to that. Oh, and by the way, if you stay up even later, or maybe if you wake up really early, you'll be able to see Mars as well, the red planet. And we can see Mars being kind of close to Antares here, so be sure not to get them mixed up. Remember, Antares is the one that's twinkling, and Mars is not twinkling. And I should mention uh, that uh, Mars uh, and all the planets do not twinkle in our night sky because they're a lot closer than distant stars. Stars are so far away that only a tiny amount of their light reaches the Earth, and that tiny amount of light passes through the Earth's atmosphere, uh, which causes that little bit of light to become distorted, and that's why stars twinkle. But planets are a lot closer than distant stars, so more of their light is reflected back towards Earth, so they appear as a wider disk of light, and they do not twinkle. I saw we just got a question from Aaron asking if uh, the conjunction is a coincidence that it's happening on the solstice, the winter solstice. And that is a coincidence. I actually had somebody ask that uh, during a previous star tour, and that's a great question, but it is a complete coincidence. In fact, you can look at... Um, uh, uh, let's see, calendars of previous great conjunctions, uh, and we can see uh, that uh, they, uh, let's see, here we go, they do not always happen on December 21st, so the last one was on May 28th, year 2000, one before that, July 24th, 1984. Um, back in 1980, there was one on December 31st, but uh, not one on that solstice, so it's just kind of a fun coincidence that that is happening uh, like that for this time, but that's still a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, the solstice uh, is more uh, due to the interactions of uh, the Earth's tilt, uh, its axial tilt in relation to its orbit around the sun. Uh, that corresponds with the changing season, so it's not affected at all, or other planets are not affected at all by our, sol our solstice. 
Uh, and there is one more question, which we will end the Star Tour with because it's a very uh, appropriate question. Uh, Stephanie is asking, what does Harry Potter have to do with the constellations? And I'm glad you asked that question because that gives me a perfect opportunity to segue into our upcoming Wednesday deep dive stream this week. Um, we had a ton of fun two weeks ago during our last Wednesday deep dive uh, where we talked about fantastical worlds of fiction. We dived deep into the fantastical flat world of Discworld. Uh, we talked about Westeros in the Game of Thrones universe. Uh, and we talked a little bit about Star Wars as well. But uh, there was a lot of other information that I, and other, a lot of other notes that I made that I didn't have time to cover. And one of the main things is, of course, Harry Potter. Harry Potter and the Wizarding World uh, has a lot of ties to astronomy. Uh, and uh, we are definitely going to dive in. And actually, we, are, we have already announced that this Wednesday, that will be the topic for that entire stream. Uh, so tune in on Wednesday at 6 p.m. We are going to dive into the astronomy and science of Harry Potter and that universe. And we might cover a couple other universes if we have time after that. But don't miss that stream. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, and hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Again, 6 p.m. on Wednesday for that uh, Astronomy of Harry Potter stream. Excited for that. And again, if you missed any of our previous streams, our deep dive streams, all those recordings can be found on the Planetarium Facebook page. So be sure to check those out. Uh, and if you have any questions, if you're watching this after we've been live, just drop those in the comment section and we'll be sure to keep an eye out for that and hopefully answer those questions on Wednesday for you. And to those of you who did ask questions this time, thank you so much for participating. It's always fun uh, to talk to you all on the other side of this screen. And I can't wait to talk to you all uh, from the actual planetarium. Uh, so be sure to check out unionstation.org for information on our plans for reopening safely and slowly. Uh, in the meantime, I hope all of you stay safe. Uh, be excellent to each other and uh, party on, y'all. See you next time.